So this is Vijay. Hello. Uh, this is UTV uh, Analytics webinar. Welcome, uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the IT sector, and um, and I am very glad to have along with me today uh, Jeff Carlson from Cubix Analytics, and also BJ Reddy, uh, investment manager at uh, Intel Capital. Um, BJ has uh, has been uh, has been working as an investment manager at Intel Capital, a leading investments in AI infrastructure in various domains. Um, he's a board observer and has met uh, deals in uh, quite a few uh, startups, and he's helped uh, various leaders previously. He's also um, he's also uh, he also holds uh, BS in, uh, in, and and uh, FS degrees in uh, electrical and computer engineering. Um, so VJ, uh, very glad to have you to have you on board with us. Nice to be happy to be here. Um, nice meeting you as well. Hey guys, this is Jeff. Okay. All right. Um, so we, we are on air already. Um, so um, let's start with the presentation. I'm, I'm uh, glad to have both of you here. Um, before before we move on to the sector, uh, the sector, the data, and uh, some of the uh, data trends from the first half of the year, I, I would just like to remind our audience that uh, we are a global uh, publishing group specializing uh, in uh, three. Uh, uh, three business publications. We have three business publications. Global Corporate Venturing, uh, which is our most uh, well-known publication. Um, and uh, as the name well suggests, it it deals with um, it deals with uh, uh, corporate corporate uh, venture venture investments uh, that uh, that go into our uh, analytics platform called GCD Analytics. In addition to that, we have the Global University Venturing uh, Venturing publication, which deals with uh, technology and innovation coming out of academia. Um, as well as uh, our uh, still nascent publication of Global Impact Venturing, where we try to uh, cover what is the social impact that corporate venturers are trying to make onto the world. Um, in addition to that, we also offer the uh, Global Corporate Venturing uh, Academy program, which is led by Paul Morris. Um, a veteran in the uh, CDC industry. He was leading uh, Dow, uh, Dow Chemicals uh, CDC unit for many, many years. And this program is meant for uh, professionals that are involved in the setting up uh, of a CDC unit or a CDC program of a kind. And uh, as a way, as our way for bringing the corporate venturing community together, we, we've also formed the uh, GCV Leadership Society, um, which uh, which uh, brings together some of the uh, some of the leaders of uh, some of the most active uh, CDC units around the world. Now, most people uh, most people know us uh, for for our events, um, and uh, our, our two biggest events are uh, undoubtedly the GCV uh, Innovation Summit, uh, which takes place in Monterey um, in late January in California, and uh, our GCV Symposium, which takes place in London in a in late May. Um, in addition to those, we have various uh, regional events, such as the, the event in Brazil, the, the events in Israel. Um, our next two upcoming events are uh, Synergize, uh, which is going to take place in New York City on September 25th. And uh, this event tries to bring together um, CDCs and, uh, and traditional VC funds that are in the, look, uh, in the lookout uh, for uh, corporate LPs. And uh, we also have GCD Energy uh, in late November, November 20th and 21st in uh, taking place in Houston, the oil and gas uh, capital of the world. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the data uh, that we uh, gather and that we provide, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to us at uh, gcvanalytics.com. And um, our platform is supported by Cubix Analytics. And uh, now I'm delighted to uh, hand over hand over to uh, to Jeff, who's going to present some data on the first half of, uh, of this year. Thanks, Kyle Ian. Uh, this is Jeff Carlson from Cubix Analytics. And I'm just going to do kind of a, a quick snapshot overview of the 
macro trends of what's been going on in, in the investment world where corporates have been involved. Um, if I can get, there we go. Um, so I'm really going to focus on the first half of 2019 relative to how it looked prior to that. Um, on the bottom, I'm showing the number of deals where there's been at least one corporate. The, I'm showing where there's a number of deals. I guess you're okay. Um, number of deals yeah, I can hear you. where there's at least one corporate involved um, over the last uh, six years or so. And what we see is a, a fairly uh, you know, consistent trend increase in the, the volume of, of deals where corporates have been involved. It's about a 17% year over year increase um, since uh, you know, 2014 to 2019. On the top, on the other hand, I'm showing that the total dollars of the investments in which corporates have participated. And we've seen a pretty significant also upward trend um, going up year over year over the last few years, um, except for this last um, interesting, what we see is what happened over the first half of 2019, we see a fairly significant drop. It's, um, we did see a drop back a few years ago, but not as severe as what we're seeing here. So that's kind of interesting. So uh, let's take a look at what's driving that a little bit. Um, if we look at the dollars um, invested by region and looking at the big three, Asia, North America, and Europe, we see that the pink being um, North America, that's been fairly consistent upward trend. Uh, that dropped somewhat in the last uh, first half of this year. Um, Europe has, is a small portion of it, and but has been growing fairly consistently. The big drop, on the other hand, is this Asia, where we're seeing it, it dropped you know, by over over 50% in the last, from the same time last year. Um, so pretty interesting to see that. One of the things we've talked about in the past is whether or not um, some of the, the dollars associated with investments in, in Asia were sort of an artificial inflation, whether there was some, some hype going on and maybe inflation, the numbers that were artificial. And, and so uh, the numbers in the past with grain of salt. So it could be, at least part of that may be uh, some of that going away and getting more realistic numbers. On this chart now, I'm showing um, average deal size by year um, by those big three regions as well. So the width shows a number of deals. So you kind of get a sense of the relative weighting of each of the bars. The height is obviously the average deal size in each region. And then the gray bar across um, in each case is the, the aggregate, the weighted average um, for that year. Um, what we've been seeing in prior years is the Asian uh, deal sizes have been significantly above, like, you know, a factor of two or so greater than those in North America and had been pulling up the average deal size consistently. Uh, the one thing we see different in 2019 is quite a drop in the average deal size in Asia coming down, you know, by over 50% and now more in line with what we see in North America. Um, interesting to see whether or not, you know, whether some of that sort of the hype going away or if that's real. Um, and finally, now looking a little bit by, by sector, first we're going to look at, well, by region, look at the numbers. The top numbers are the same numbers you were seeing above by total dollars invested. The bottom number represents the percent change from 2018 first half. So this one percent is the drop, the 21 billion versus the 55 billion in the first half of last year. You can see Asia, obviously, the big drop, whereas North America, Europe, and South America are all actually up relative to how, what they look like in the first half of 2018. So let's double click into this Asia a little bit and now look at that across the various sectors. And the color represents just like it is over here, represents the percent change. Um, and we can see almost across the board, uh, large drops in the, the dollars being invested in Asia. Um, by consumer, 73%, 74% financial services, almost 90%, uh, you know, health, 35%, media is down 76, et cetera. So you see a significant drop across the board in terms of investment dollars in Asia. Um, so that's really it, kind of the macro view, of what happened in the first half of the, this year. And now I think we're going to pass it back over to LIN. Take it from here. 
All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, it's, uh, it's been fascinating. Very interesting. Very interesting presentation. It, it does seem like uh, um, the total of investment dollars uh, has been really hard hit uh, in Asia and not so much in uh, in the rest of the world. And uh, we're yet to see how how things are going to unfold by the end of by the end of this year. Now, um, I'm going to move on with the IT sector presentation and. Uh, and I'm going to engage our, our special guest, uh, DJ, uh, in, with, with some questions uh, as I go along. Uh, I'll, now I'm taking the opportunity to remind uh, the people who are watching us live uh, right now that they could uh, submit their questions on the um, control panel that appears on the right hand side of their uh, of their screen uh, there is a section called questions and they could type them up uh, and uh, and submit them and uh, um, we, we will try to answer answer those questions uh, by the end of uh, by the end of today's session or at the end of today's session uh, rather um, as we which we will try to keep interesting and uh, reasonably uh, re reasonably long or reasonably reasonably short so um, so let's get right into the IT sector um, uh, first of all how do we define the IT sector and, and GCV um, for us uh, it, it encompasses uh, very very broad broad fields uh, it it includes uh, things like uh, general AI applications big data tech and analytics uh, virtual and augmented reality technologies uh, semiconductors and microchips cybersecurity enterprise software and other IT tech and uh, and related uh, services so it's a quite broad definition that we use and um, if we try to comment on general trends uh, that appear in this sector, um, we see that uh, the digitization of today's world, which is something we observe in every sector, not just IT, is inextricably linked to the uh, datafication phenomenon and the rise of uh, the rise of big data. Um, and um, in terms of big, the big data rise, there's been uh, there's been much focus on ad hoc uh, data analytics, but this is expected to evolve as uh, as we continue uh, seeing the development of both big data and uh, and other tech. And uh, right now, uh, most according to most surveys, uh, some organizations say uh, that they are competing on data and analytics. In other words, that's becoming the playing field. And 62% uh, say uh, they have seen already some measurable results from investments in big data and, uh, and artificial intelligence. And indeed, if we think about uh, big data and uh, its bigness, uh, it's kind of unthinkable. Uh, um, you know, the idea of working with it uh, in an efficient way without artificial intelligence on or or uh, machine learning, or some other type of cognitive tech. So, I would like to uh, I would like to ask uh, VJ here, um, VJ, in your impression as an investor specializing in AI, what proportion of uh, cognitive tech applications out there have some touch points with uh, with the big data phenomenon um, in general, and in your experience as a as an investor? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I think the the proportion is large, right? I think for, for a couple of reasons. One is um, the machine learning and the deep learning te techniques especially tend to perform better uh, with lots of data. And the second is companies that are more digitally mature in that they've invested uh, in big data infrastructure tend to have a, a strong starting point and be committed to realizing value for the data. So um, in, in a lot of our portfolio companies, um, having um, a big data strategy precedes their investment in AI. And we typically find more digitally mature sectors like FinTech and healthcare uh, adopt AI faster because they're earlier on the data journey than um, sectors like travel or utilities, right? Uh -huh. And um, by adopting AI early, I think it gives a lot of these big companies scale and competitive differentiation, which further, further the gap. So um, as our portfolio companies look to, um, look to qualify um, sales, um, big data adoption or AI strategy or data strategies are definitely prerequisite. 
I see. And uh, what are some of the other subsectors or subsets of uh, of AI or cognitive tech broadly that are out there? Um, as an expert, could you give us uh, a bit more of a of an overview on on those as well, very briefly, please? Um, sure. Um, there's different ways to dice the sectors, and I think for us, uh, we broadly classify into four categories. Um, on the bottom is the AI infrastructure, which is um, the foundational technology in which a lot of the AI is built, and that includes silicon, um, some low-level libraries, um, and so on. And we have several investments in that sector as well. Uh, on top of that, we're looking at the platform layer, um, which includes data prep, model building, model monitoring, model deployment, DevOps, CI, CD. So that's one more sector we've defined on top of the infrastructure layer. And we look at applications in two lenses. One is horizontal applications, whether it's computer vision, um, NLP speech, um, broad uh, horizontal platforms, or very verticalized applications in, vert in sectors, for example, autonomous sector, fintech, federal, uh, and so on. So that's the way we look at the landscape of investments. And within that, um, we, we look to invest in um, category leading companies uh, in each of those places. Yeah, so so a very, very, very broad view uh, indeed. Um, and when we talk when we talk about uh, cognitive tech and uh, AI in particular, uh, we do see we do see um, according to some latest surveys of uh, executives and um, employees and, and organizations that uh, most uh, uh, that, that adoption of AI technology is 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 already uh, fairly fairly widespread among businesses, and um, a lot of survey respondents say uh, they already have achieved some sort of a financial return on their AI investments. So um, I'm I'm really curious as to your perspective with regards to uh, this sort of an idea of financial return. Uh, of AI adopters, uh, adopters of AI tech. Uh, to what extent do you believe that is that is measurable? Um, are there perhaps any examples of any of the portfolio companies that you have worked with uh, that um, have had a, some some measurable positive impact on the financials of a of a client of theirs or or something? Could you share that with us? Like absolutely right. So, so there's Maybe um, I can answer this question in the lens of um, a couple of those um, automation platforms, right? So we're investors in Data Robot, we're investors in Paper Space, and Avamo. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a lot of times we see the ecosystem through the lens of how these companies engage with the uh, enterprises. And um, I think a couple of themes. Uh, number one is identifying the use case where AI can actually be helpful is probably the hardest and the biggest bottleneck um, for a lot of enterprises because um, they understand that AI is um, can add value, but finding those high value use cases which actually impact the business, um, that that's the hard part, um, especially is it increasing the top line or is it um, decreasing the bottom line? So um, mm -hmm. first is to identify the use cases. The second is um, a lot of cases they're experimenting with um, value add, but they don't have a plan to put production, to models into production. And those kind of use cases are pretty short-lived. And so I, I think the nuance there is while most enterprises see the value, very few actually are putting it into production. And that's actually changing now where more and more AI is going into production. And um, last but not the least is we find that if the relevant stakeholders, whether it's the business group or the data science team or the IT have not bought in, um, even if the model goes into production, it's short-lived. So we tend to look at um, how the model not, not just find value, but actually go into production and um, has all the stakeholders bought in. I see. I see. So, so basically how the model um, is going to be adopted and there to stay. You know, exactly. Let's see. 
Um, and and the last bullet point that I have here on on this slide um, really really pertains more to the to the uh, potential social issues uh, that might arise with with AI technology. Gee, so so I do uh, I did find uh, some surveys that 62 percent of respondents. Uh, um, this, this is businesses responding. Uh, they say they're using automation to eliminate eliminate uh, basically repetitive uh, drudgerous tasks, and 47% uh, uh, are augmenting existing work um, practices to improve productivity. So um, there is there is a there is a bit of a, a bit of a controversy around this issue, right? Um, broadly speaking, and uh, and. Many many analysts out there seem to agree that the impact of uh, wider AI tech adoption is not going to be the same over um, skilled the skilled part of the labor force as it is, or as it might be over the not so skilled members of the labor force. So, um, as an AI investor and AI expert, what is what is your personal uh, tech? Uh, take on this, uh, BJ. So, so I guess the question is, is AI going to impact skilled jobs and non-skilled jobs? And um, I think there's there's talk about non-skilled repetitive work being replaced by AI. And I kind of disagree to a certain extent with that because, so if you look at a lot of the jobs, uh, skilled jobs, right, um, mm -hmm. like radiology or wealth management. I mean, I, I think those are the, some of the jobs which are going to be replaced very quickly, um, along with a lot of non-skilled jobs like autonomous driving is going to replace a lot of the Uber drivers or robots are going to replace a lot of um, uh, workers in the warehouses. So I don't see it as skilled with unskilled because um, AI is going to replace a lot of different kinds of jobs. But um, I think I agree that a lot of repetitive tasks which need low cognition um, those are low-hanging fruit for AI, whether it's skilled or unskilled. And mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of um, AI applications at RPA or um, even in computer vision and a lot of other tasks which are being replaced um, by AI um, just because AI is really good at doing the repetitive task often again and again with high level of accuracy. I see. I see. So, and, so, you, you, so you believe there's going to be a male storm uh, of a, of a creative destruction of a kind uh, across all types of all types of jobs really um, yeah and and maybe just to like maybe um, one more side note is um, in a lot of cases AI is actually augmenting the human for example um, if you look at healthcare AI they're actually helping a doctor become more productive um, mm -hmm. so the more AI becomes mainstream I think people will find ways to be more productive in things they're really good at, which is like being creative and solving very complex problems. Um, so there's a, there's a case to be made that AI is augmenting and um, not necessarily replacing as a lot of people think um, AI would do. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so, so, so in 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 this uh, in this context. Uh, in this context of overall digitization and uh, datafication and uh, cognitive uh, cognitive tech, uh, there is uh, obviously a place for um, the issue and the sector of cybersecurity, which uh, some have uh, have called probably the most uh, profitable subsector of uh, of tech because it uh, it fights a threat that uh, that is really unceasing. And indeed, if we look at uh, if we look at some estimates, uh, the sector was worth uh, 3.5 billion back in uh, 2004, and uh, it was worth 120 billion in 2017. So it, it has grown 35 times over just uh, just 13 years in a way. And the global spending on cybersecurity is forecast to exceed uh, actually cumulatively one trillion by 2021 which is not not that far away from uh, from uh, from now so um, um, in, in in that context uh, what we do another tech that we enabling uh, broader tech that we see is uh, obviously cloud cloud computing and cloud tech um, 
and um, almost every every organization, uh, according to the latest surveys, it uses some uh, cloud tech at some level, whether it's public or pri private clouds. Um, and uh, th this is quite significant, and I believe it's it's likely to uh, we're likely to continue seeing uh, adoption of uh, wider adoption of such technologies, um, particularly in the context of Internet of Things uh, and edge computing and other things, uh, other exciting things happening right now. Um, now, one of the things uh, one of the things that we that we do see as a possible possible interesting divergence is between um, VR and AR tech. Uh, and VR and AR are often uh, kind of lumped together by, by analysts, even though they are quite different. And um, if we look at their fundamentals, such as uh, installed base uh, and, uh, you know, expected forecast revenues, uh, they are very, very different as uh, the information shown uh, shown here on uh, here on the slide uh, and uh, you know uh, this uh, the, it, it's it's a very exciting time and uh, we we are yet to see what's uh, what's going to become of uh, of AR which seems to be uh, the more promising tech at the moment and VR which uh, despite its uh, wider possible applications seems to be gaining traction mostly in the in the realm of games and uh, gaming and entertainment, uh, more than 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 in other things, um, so it's, it's a, another very exciting tech. And um, finally, since uh, we do have someone from uh, someone from Intel, well, actually Intel Capital, um, uh, I can't help but uh, also mention the. Uh, the semiconductors and, and chips business. So um, we did see a recent drop um, in public markets uh, of, semicon of the semiconductor sector. Um, but uh, there's, uh, despite that drop, uh, there are major drivers of revenue that are expected to, uh, to exert their positive impact. So that's things like uh, IoT, um, 5G telecoms and networks, cognitive tech and all that. So I'd like to ask you, uh, VJ, um, despite that drop uh, in public equity markets, uh, um, we, we expect these new technology, these technologies to be main drivers uh, behind uh, Intel's core business. So how are computational requirements uh, likely to grow with AI in the medium and long long term and uh, how is that uh, how is that going to drive Intel's core business yeah so um, as Intel I think we have several products um, which are coming out and we're excited about the possibility of using AI for a lot of the training and inference but I'll focus mostly on our investment side of things and um, we have several investments um, in what people call the training aspect, uh, mostly in the data center, and also in the inference in the cloud and inference at the edge. And um, we've invested in companies like Habana, Sam Bonova, Untether, Neuroblade, Sintian, and others. And um, these are very specific architectures. Uh, the right range from um, being specific at doing one thing very well, um, like for example, an accelerator, to more general purpose um, kind of compute. And um, I, th I think underlying, though the companies have taken different approaches, the need for compute has increased exponentially. So um, let's take training, for example. If you see the latest OpenAI report, since 2012, um, compute has, the need for compute, at least for the largest AI training ones, has increased exponentially every three and a half months, right? And that means like 300x increase in compute. And there is going to be innovation in um, technology in terms of process and um, baseline like materials and so on. But uh, there's a lot of interesting work on the um, architecture which is being implemented and not just the hardware but also the software. So we need to cope up with this 300x, 300,000x uh, increase in compute, and um, a lot of these companies are attacking this same market in different ways. And um, we are very, very excited about um, silicon investments uh, for a change, um, given how incredibly 
um, there's a need for this kind of compute, right? Hmm. I see. So it's a uh, it's a very very exciting uh, exciting field. Yeah. Um, all right. So the, before before I uh, let the whole hour uh, go um, with uh, with questions, I, I I'd like to cover some of the some of the data that we we uh, we we've provided. Uh, so so um, if if we look into uh, the data by. Uh, on, on deals by IT done by IT corporates between June last year and May this year, we tracked 659 deals around the globe. Um, vast majority of them, uh, 346 actually, it's about half of them, excuse me, um, uh, were in the, taking place in the United States. Uh, 92 in China, also very notably. Um, so. So, so the way the way um, IT uh, corporate investors uh, commit capital, that they invest mostly in uh, in emerging in emerging IT businesses, which is uh, hardly surprising. And uh, by, by that we mean uh, it's mostly in uh, things like AI, semiconductors, and cybersecurity, among other things. If we if we look at their investors across other other significant sectors in in the services sector, we see uh, they've committed uh, quite a few uh, to quite a few deals in uh, HR tech or ed tech. In uh, in the case of media, um, there's uh, there's a lot of commitments in digital marketing and app tech, games and gaming, audio and video uh, content and technologies and uh, that sort of thing. And of course, in uh, in the life sciences, there is the rising rising field of healthcare, healthcare IT, and uh, a lot of big data um, being uh, being tapped into and used uh, right now. There, um, so uh, it, it's it's a very very broad uh, broad range of uh, range of sectors. And uh, if we look at uh, some of the co investments. Of, uh, of uh, IT, um, IT or uh, tech ventures. Uh, there is, a, we do, we do see once again, once again, a kind of a kind of a confirmation of that. We, we on this spider diagram, we see uh, there is a lot of um, a lot of different tech here, from uh, smart grid tech like uh, Actility to 3D printing like desktop metal. Um, IoT networks like Foghorn and uh, data storage like uh, Wika.io and uh, and even ride hailing like uh, Gojek. So so a very very broad range. And um, you know I I I remember uh, Vijay. I remember one of your colleagues, Lee Sessions, asked me asked me for some statistics on co-investments between between corporates and it and uh when i when i looked into the data it did turn out that intel capital is actually uh the one the one cvc co-investing with with most other corporates um and not just corporates within the, the tech sector corporates from any sector across any sector so um would you would you like to take the opportunity uh to tell us about some Perhaps some recent deals that uh, you guys have done and uh, co-invested with other CVCs, uh, and how that uh, that has played out. Absolutely, I think um, we we pride ourselves in building a syndicate and being a a corporate venture group ourselves. Um, we think of how other corporates can add value uh, by co-investing with us. So we welcome um, co-investing with our CVCs. In fact, we um, intentionally share a lot of the deals with other um, CVCs as well, but um, mm -hmm. we tend to lead most of our deals. Uh, in uh, I think we're tracking to like more than two thirds of our deals we actually lead, and uh, we try to bring on the right partner um, from a CVC um, who can help this company with complementary skill sets. So, for example, uh, we recently invested in a company called Babel Labs, uh, which we co-led with uh, Dell Capital. And we also had Samsung participate in the round. Um, other is um, Sambanova, and we had uh, Samsung in there as well. You were the and, person uh, leading that deal, right? Yourself, right? So the Sambanova yeah. one. Yeah. So, so Sambanova, Babel, we led the deal. Actually, in, in the case of Babel, we co-led it with Dell. And that's very atypical when you look at 
um, how deals are being done in the Valley, right? It's, it's hard to find deals which are being co-led. Um, but Dell, in this case, brings complementary value, so does Samsung. And it, it made a lot of sense for us to not be greedy and take the whole round, but to partner with other um, CBCs very actively. And mm -hmm. we have uh, other deals, uh, which I'm involved with, Avamo and Foghorn, and you have AI in there. And um, it's a very healthy syndicate. And um, I, I think CBCs coming together um, actually shows that they can add more value than um, just a single VC. That's uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, there was recently recently a, a report that came out of uh, PitchBook, um, and uh, you know I, I actually uh, managed to uh, give some pointers to the one of the authors of, of this report uh, for this, and uh, there there does exist some some evidence, some strong evidence from from data that uh, CDCs do provide uh, to their uh, Corporate uh, to, to their uh, portfolio companies as, as corporates, they do provide uh, additional value, which perhaps uh, traditional VC investors uh, may not be able to, and uh, and that's uh, that's very important uh, for for you guys as a as a class of class of uh, venture investors. Um, so so moving along, moving along with uh, with our presentation here. Um, the if, if we look at the evolution of investments of IT corporates uh, on an annual basis, we see that it uh, it went up uh, last year. Uh, so um, if we look at uh, if we look at the numbers, uh, the uh, total deal count uh, went up from 553 in 2017 to 626 in 2018. And uh, so that uh, the total dollars, and when when we when we use total total dollars, let me just take the opportunity to uh, to clarify to the audience, uh, these are the sum totals of uh, all known rounds uh, where where there is at least one uh, one corporate in the syndicate. So this is not just corporate dollars. This is the sum total of uh, of all the deals. Um, but but even even though this this is a broad measure, it's uh, it, it's quite helpful in, in seeing how uh, valuations seem to be seem to be moving and overall dollars seem to be moving in certain tech areas. Um, so 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 uh, so the dollars the total dollars went up from uh, just north of uh, 34 billion to uh, 40 or uh, 41.5 billion. Um, in, in 2018, and uh, we're yet to see uh, how uh, 2019 uh, is going to uh, turn up. But uh, VJ, what is what is your reaction when you see when you see this uh, this graph here? What, what what are your expectations about about um, you know IT corporate invest corporate VC investors? Uh, overall, uh, do you expect some sort of a slowdown related to a potential downturn in the broader economy? Yeah, I, I can't. Um, I can't predict downturns. I think a lot of smart people have tried, and um, I've been saying a downturn is coming for the last few years. But right. um, I think if I just look at the PwC report, which came out recently, right, the Q2 as well, um, looks like we are on track um, to have a record investment here, not just across um, IT itself, but all across venture capital, right? And I think uh, within that sector, IT and AI, uh, I think we're on track for a 20-year um, historical increase in um, investments in venture capital. And um, that tells me that a lot of other investors are not banking on an immediate downturn. And mm -hmm. um, But personally, I, I think um, at least in the space of AI, uh, we're going to see um, some companies who have not paid attention to unit economics. Uh, there's going to be a slight correction in terms of the valuations, but I think that's healthy for the space overall um, in terms of um, a market correction, if there is one. Mm -hmm. And in terms of a correction of the of the valuations, that's uh, that might actually uh, not at all be a bad thing for for you guys as investors because it would give you an opportunity to to buy low, right? No, absolutely. I, th I think there was maybe in the last couple of years, at least in the AI space, there was um, a lot of exuberance. Um, I don't mm -hmm. know if it's qualified as irrational, but um, the, I, I think there was. Um, some companies 
which have raised at a higher valuation than they were supposed to be at that stage. And I think we'll, we'll start to see some um, rationalizing in terms of uh, valuations at a given stage of revenues, right? And I think that's a good thing because we can um, we can look at companies um, more for their um, for the growth metrics than just hype. I see. I see. Um, great. Uh, now uh, moving along with uh, with the rest of the rest of the presentation here. That's based on the um, our latest IT report. Um, we'll, on, the, on this chart, uh, very briefly, we see the the top uh, corporate investors um, over the over the past year. So we have Alphabet, Salesforce, uh, Tencent, Samsung, and Intel. So uh, the the usual suspects. Intel is still uh, still within within the top, uh, even though uh, you guys do seem to have uh, to have uh, a more concentrated uh, sort of investment mandate at the moment. But uh, uh, Intel's traditionally been one of the most active uh, the most active investors uh, in this space and uh, will uh, likely remain to be. Um, now, if we look at um, if we look at top corporate investors from the IT sector and from other sectors in emerging IT startups and emerging IT businesses. Unsurprisingly, we see, again, uh, names like Alphabet, Intel, and Dell uh, within, uh, within the top, uh, top three, top five list, uh, which, again, is hardly surprising. Um, in, uh, in, if we, in terms of the uh, corporate-backed deals in emerging IT uh, startups. Uh, if we if we sort of break them down into subsectors, undoubtedly uh, big data, uh, AI, and cybersecurity, uh, along with enterprise software, are the leading leading sort of uh, broad broad uh, subsectors. Um, and um, even if we if we look at uh, co investments. Co-investments in IT enterprises. Now, now we do see that. Uh, first of all, looking at this, uh, looking at this graph, the first thing that uh, that, uh, that that we notice is that the tech or IT corporate ventures do co-invest with uh, with a broad range of, of other companies, whether it's companies from the automotive sector like BMW or from the financial like JP Morgan. Um, or um, even uh, Air, uh, Airbus or banks, things like that, um, AT&T from the telecom sector. So a broad range of, uh, of corporate co-investors. Uh, and um, in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, the sort of tech that's represented here, uh, now we do see uh, things like cybersecurity. You see uh, names of Ionic Security. Cyber GRX teammate that are all cybersecurity in the cybersecurity business. Uh, we do see uh, artificial intelligence tech like GraphCore. We do see uh, also big data like uh, Abeja and uh, and even uh, augmented reality tech like Magic Leap. Um, so the, there's a there's still a very 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 broad range of uh, of things that corporates. Uh, from uh, the IT sector and from other sectors are interested in emerging tech businesses. Uh, that's that's the main the main message that I'm trying to trying to uh, convey with uh, with this slide basically. Um, now, if we look at if we look at the top deals, uh, I'm, I'm conscious that uh, we're we're like at least a good 40 minutes into the webinar, but so I'm not going to go into uh, into much detail on every deal, but uh, um, every, um, every, every each one of those deals is described in, in our latest report, the latest uh, issue of our magazine. So anyone interested could read it, uh, read it there. But basically, just to mention the uh, the top three, uh, we have the uh, U.S.-based satellite service provider OneWeb, which was backed by uh, by Qualcomm, uh, raised a, a big round of 1.25 billion. Um, we had the India-based uh, food delivery um, platform Swiggy, backed by backed by Naspers and Tencent, also raised uh, one uh, one billion. And uh, the Indonesia ride-hailing platform Gojek uh, also uh, 
that also raised a billion dollars uh, of a round um, backed by Alphabet, Alphabet and Tencent, uh, as well as uh, actually JD.com, which is a, an e-commerce uh, platform in uh, in China. So uh, quite a bit of corporate, uh, quite a bit of corporate uh, co-investment uh, right there. Um, so in addition to deals, we also try to uh, try to track exits uh, that involve corporate investors, whether it's uh, as exiting investors or sometimes even as, as acquirers of, of those companies where they may have invested in all that's that's a, kind of a rare, rare occurrence in, in the industry, really, according to our statistics. Um, so over the over the, the period that we were looking at between uh, June last year and May this year, there were 92 exits uh, for IT investors. If we look at uh, the whole of uh, 2018, we we saw 105 and uh, 34 uh, by the end of by the end of May. Um, so um, among those, uh, we did have we did see 63 acquisitions, uh, 27 IPOs. So uh, quite an active uh, quite an active period for for exits uh, indeed. And um, you know if we look at the just the top top exits of, for IT ventures, uh, we, we do see uh, the big IPOs of the big and much uh, awaited IPOs of I should say of Uber and and Lyft here on the list. We see the IPO of uh, Xiaomi in uh, in Meituan Yanping in in China. So uh, it's been a very very interesting year for the sector in terms of in terms of exits as well. Um, However, what might be a bit a bit more worrisome uh, is uh, you know the, the state of funding initiatives that we try to track. We try to track uh, funding initiatives uh, in terms of whether it's uh, VC funds with uh, corporate LPs, whether it's newly launched CVC units or corporate backed accelerators and incubators. And uh, we do see for such initi initiatives that are meant to back uh, IT IT technologies uh, there there seems to be seems to be a kind of a, a kind of a, a kind of a drop or a kind of a decline over the past couple of years in both number of such initiatives and and, and dollars and uh, that might potentially potentially be uh, be a warning sign for the future although that's of course very hard to predict and uh, and uh, we're yet to see what what uh, indeed uh, will transpire. Um, so um, again, I'm I'm not I'm not going to I'm conscious of time, so I'm not going to uh, not going to uh, go into much detail on the top funding initiatives that we track. But uh, what's what's noted what's highly noticeable on, on, on this chart is that not not a single one of these funds is uh, over a billion dollars so uh, uh that that might have some serious implications about uh, about uh, the growth of, of valuations of tech companies uh in the in the coming in the coming years um and finally, just uh, to briefly touch on um, venturing and uh, sort of innovation coming coming out of academia, we did see uh, in 2018, as this graph shows, um, quite a bit of uh, like quite a bit of a peak, uh, 118 uh, 18 deals, like very successful deals of. Uh, um, companies coming out of academia that have raised capital and. Uh, and it's it poses an interesting an interesting question, which I'd like to extend to VJ here. Um, so, what are the what are the kind of interesting things that you see coming out of uh, coming out of top schools and coming out of academia um, that you see as investable things? Yeah, so so Intel has many touch points with um, academia, right? Um, we have mm -hmm. an organization within Intel called Intel Labs, which actively sponsors research coming out of top um, universities. And for this context, in AI, uh, we're funding um, leading researchers in um, CMU, MIT, um, a lot of different institutions. So we mm -hmm. get to have some visibility into kind of um, the research which might lead into commercial opportunities. And from the venture capital side, um, we actively engage with um, the academic community. For example, 
Um, we recently invested in, in Andrew Wink's company, Landing.ai. Um, Sam Bonova too was um, Professor Kunle and Chris Ray from Stanford. And um, so if you look across our portfolio, we tend to um, have an eye out for some of the um, academic projects which might be coming to fruition as a commercial entity. And there's a lot of good examples of uh, large AI, billion dollar AI companies um, which have been um, spawned out of university research. Uh, Databricks is an example of that, and mm -hmm. um, there's many, many examples of that. So um, we tend to work very closely with leading academic institutions, and um, in many cases, um, trying to feed their first com um, the company which comes out of uh, academia. And in terms of the areas, um, they tend to be focusing on more um, long-term projects, uh, whether it's um, AI for silicon or uh, if it's automated machine learning or, or things like federated learning or the next generation of reinforcement learning. So there's a lot of cool projects coming out of universities which um, we think can be commercialized and uh, we hope to partner with um, faculty and students coming out of these places. I see. And uh, what are the... What are the sort of uh, because you see you say that uh, that they they tend to be focused on uh, longer term uh, sort of projects. So what are some of the some of the challenges for for a technology like that coming out of academia to gain how how should I put it commercializability of a kind or investability? What what is in your observation the biggest the biggest sort of uh, stumbling block for, for such tech? Yeah, so typically, um, again, I say typically because there's different kinds of labs, and I think the labs, that, uh, especially in Bay Area, are very good at focusing the research on commercial um, mm -hmm. opportunities, but a, a lot of research um, tends to be focused on long-term, right? And I think the, the key challenge we see is um, um, a lot of teams come up with very innovative products, but mm -hmm. um, they don't have the business acumen or they have not brought on the right people on board quickly enough to be able to um, see how they can commercialize this technology, right? And um, maybe a case in point is explainability in AI is extremely critical. There's a lot right. of research institutions working on this um, technology and a lot of professors spinning out companies um, uh, which... Uh, focus on solving this problem, but at the same time, there's groups coming out of um, hyperscalers or CS, the cloud um, providers, going after a similar problems. So, um, in many cases, people who are coming out of big companies have a more practical view of the same end solution versus um, some of them coming out of academia. And as investors, uh, we see it as a job to um, augment the team of academic professionals with the right business skill set, in which case it could be really powerful um, trying to uh, commercialize uh, research. Right. right. I see. And um, and now, um, if, if you allow me one more question, because uh, this actually concludes uh, concludes uh, pretty much uh, pretty much my my presentation. Uh, so, uh, you as an AI investor. Um, what are the biggest challenges to you in um, in sort of uh, trying to pick uh, the sort the, the sort of most promising promising investments in this uh, in this still very much emerging but very very promising and disruptive uh, sector or even I, I would call it more of a more of a horizontal in a way which goes across across many, many different sectors. So what are some of the biggest challenges to you as an investor? Yeah, so a few years ago, AI was very niche. Um, there were a few companies, there were also a few investors and um, little capital going after uh, the mm -hmm. space, let's say 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. But um, unprecedented amount of capital is chasing a few good opportunities now. Um, there are so many good technology is coming out to market, but there's also a lot of capital. Uh, it, it becomes extremely noisy in terms of identifying the right opportunity to invest in. 
um, and also being disciplined about valuations and um, trying to understand unit economics when um, in a lot of cases um, the valuations are a function of the future value, right, uh, and not predicated on this year or next year's revenue. Um, so, so identifying good um, financially relevant opportunities is definitely um, interesting. Um, the second piece is in a lot of companies, hiring talent is becoming more and more difficult um, just because there's so much competition for talent. Um, so that's an area we spend a lot of time on in hiring um, um, the right uh, talent for our portfolio companies. And last but not the least, I think this is where I'm a little bit more hopeful, is um, AI used to be very experimental in large enterprises. Um, it was a tool people used to um, play with um, to kind of get insights. But now, I think we're seeing the inflection point where AI is actually making its way into production, which, which just makes it very interesting um, uh, down the line. Right, right. Um, well, it's... Uh... Right. Uh, it, it, it's fascinating because you mentioned you mentioned valuations, and since it's a function of future value, what are some of the valuation methods? Uh, if you if you are able to share with us, just in very broad terms, um, what are some of the, the some of the valuation techniques that you that you use to value a business that might bring tremendous value to fruition just uh, years down the line? What is what are the sort of thing that uh, you use? Yeah, so I think for a lot of the enterprise like software startups, right, I, I think the metrics are very similar. Um, if you're looking at SaaS metrics, the, the regular kind of metrics you would evaluate almost any company in a given vertical. And um, I would say the the multiple is a little bit higher than what you would expect for a traditional SaaS business, but um, mm -hmm. on that side, um, especially for Series A or B companies, there is um, something to hang your valuation on. Um, for deep tech investments like Silicon, um, most companies at Seed and A haven't taped out the chip yet, right? Uh, in those well, cases, uh, it, it's very hard to um, put a number on the valuation because um, you're expecting that some of these companies are taking market share away from a lot of the incumbents. And um, so, so those, those get a little bit more trickier when you're looking at a few hundred million dollar investment in a hardware company um, when there is no product to be sold yet, right? And right. Um, in, in a lot of other deep tech investments where um, I think the time to monetization is a little bit longer, um, I think you have to be a little bit more creative when it comes to um, how you look at valuations, and that's very, um, I would say, subjective um, to a particular right. vertical or um, deal. Right. So uh, some some say it's more of an art than than a science. Really, it's uh, quite quite fascinating. <laughs> All right. Um, so I do see that there's only been one question submitted uh, by someone from the audience asking if uh, if uh, people would be able to get uh, the slides afterwards. The answer is yes. Uh, both the slides and the video recording of, uh, of this whole webinar will be uh, will be sent out um, afterwards. Um, so so since uh, since there are there are no there are no other no other questions uh, I mean un unless unless Jeff would like to ask you something uh, I guess we could we could sort of uh, wrap it up and uh, conclude this uh, this session it's, it's been wonderful having you having you on this uh, on this webinar VJ uh, thank you very very much uh, for this and uh, you know, hopefully, I haven't uh, taken uh, too much uh, too much of your your valuable time uh, as an investor this morning. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, uh, on behalf of GCV and on my personal behalf. Uh, pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having us. Um, it's um, it's an exciting space and exciting time, and love to chat about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and. Um, and uh, so uh, 
so this concludes uh, our webinars for this uh, first half of the year before the summer the summer season. Uh, there is going to be no webinar in uh, in August. Our next webinar will uh, will be sometime in uh, in September when we are going to be discussing the uh, another very exciting and uh, tech heavy sector, the telecom sector. Uh, so uh, stay stay tuned for for the date. Um, Thank, thank you very much uh, to, uh, to all of you who have attended uh, this webinar live today with us. Uh, and um, to, uh, to the rest of you, um, uh, have a good uh, uh, day, afternoon or night, wherever you might be in the world. Goodbye. Thank you.